now the time is for the question. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, fascinating talk. And my question was that um, you give a lot of examples about the intellectual resources that are available with actual discussions unfolding for, as one might say, domesticating Islam in Western Europe. And uh, my question was really how, how this um, unfolds. Probably one would have to give an answer for that for every, every country apart with um, the reverse process of, um, let's say, how um, majority societies, European states, are responding to increased the increased presence of Muslims in, in Europe. So if you, for example, in practical aspects, one would have to talk about possible legal pluralism, about um, regimes of secularism. I mean, yes, we know, I understand there were a lot of previous discussions about secularism. Um, and of course, the history of secularism here is not only tied to Christianity because it was originated as a pact between churches and the state, but also because secularism, as Taylor and others have pointed out, um, is privileged as a particular Protestant, and or largely or Christian and more particular Protestant um, understanding of what religion is. And then the implication of this would, of course, be if there's some movement among the structures controlled by the majority societies to make the process of domesticating Islam in Western Europe and Judas tribe easier, or is it really um, a one-way street of adaptation and accommodation by, by migrants? Would you mind saying who you are and you have Oh yeah, I'm Patrick Eisenberg. I'm um, here in, in, in cultural anthropology at this university. I mean, you, you, your question, in a sense, points in the direction of where I would go with a response. Um, I find it extreme. The more I work on this, the more difficult I find I find it to to give a common portrait of the situation in Europe or even Western Europe. If we just look at the bits of Europe. Um, which are Islam rising out of immigration. Um, the I mean, Fetzer and Sofa have argued uh, that the uh, church state regimes which apply in different countries have been a major factor on how um, Muslims, Muslim organizations, Islam has developed in the country's concern. Um, I think that goes some way. Um, <coughs> but I, I, mean, I think they also, they, they also accept that um, it's impossible to deal with the subject on any kind of single cause, or even dominant cause uh, kind of explanation. Um, I know you've got Tamar Lassad's book lying there. Um, <coughs> and you've got a fascinating chapter on uh, on, on, on Islam in Europe. Uh, I think he probably goes a bit too far uh, when he essentially, bad word in academic language, uh, when he essentially suggests that Islam in Europe, its, its agendas, its character, and so on, is completely determined by the majority environment, the politically dominant, powerful majority environment. Of course, that is a significant factor. Um, but I think it's, um, it flies in the face of experience to suggest that the dominant uh, power structures and, and so on are not also affected and respond to and change in response to um, assertive minorities, because that's what we're talking about. Um, why is it that in Britain, um, over the last 20 years, um, a lot of policy development, policy experimentation, policy making in relation to ethnic and religious minorities has been dominated by a response to Islam, not Sikhism, not Hinduism. Um, and even historically, um, not really in relation to Judaism either. The only other historical 
experience, which I think compares to that of the um, give and take between the dominant system and the minority, the political minority anyway, the political weak party, uh, it is the relationship between the governing system and the Catholics in the 17th, 18th, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And if you compare those two experiences, the Catholic experience was a good deal more bloody um, and a good deal uh, more um, <coughs> critical than what we're experiencing uh, with Islam today. But to pretend that the English-British public discourse, system, legislation, government, administrative policies and so on are um, are not in response in some way or other being impacted by the, the assertive presence of Muslims in Britain. It, it, is, I mean, it flies in the face of fact. But of course, um, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why, not just the European reasons why um, the responses and the situation are different. The French secularism is one thing, the English secularism is definitely another thing. Um, But an element is also what the Muslim immigrant community has brought with them. I, mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, Islam in Germany is in many ways subject to much, much tighter legal control, especially if it's Turkish Islam, than it is in most other uh, countries in Europe, basically because, especially after the coup of September, of the, 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 the close, near civil war situations in Turkey, leading up to the coup of September 1980. It was in the interest of both states to keep Turkish Islam, Turkish Muslim organizations under some form of, um, of uh, joint control. So the DNN has uh, legal status, institutional status within Turkey, which it has nowhere else in Europe. The Swedes at the other end of the extreme had deliberately sought to keep any kind of foreign a religious organization out um, of uh, institutional involvement until very recently. And the role of the DNF in the Netherlands or in Denmark um, is not nearly as strong, uh, as politically well founded as it is in, in Germany. Um, and when you start looking at individual countries, I mean, if you look at Britain, Islam in Bradford is different from Islam in Birmingham. Really different. Um, it becomes difficult to see the wood for the trees if you go too far down this road. Um, but I think, it's a, I think it's a useful corrective to the kind of um, semi-ideological analysis that someone might have I mean, I think he's got some good points which are worth taking on board, but um, they don't work for me as a single explanation, as a dominant picture. I'm Kyle Steinbrink, I'm retired, but uh, until two years ago at the theology <coughs> department. Um, well, I was quite surprised uh, at your last uh, remark that Western scholars of Islam are participants in this process. Well, they have been for a very long time, and it reminded me of someone like Sunko Ghanje, who was called the Mufti of uh, Batavia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of uh, so why are you surprised? Hmm? So why are you surprised? Um, well, I thought that that period was over, but um, <laughs> apparently not. Uh, well, one of the reasons um, may be the legal structure of the Netherlands and also the overwhelming difference between Muslims. And uh, so then, even a Dutch minister like Rita van Donk. She established a Muslim council in the Netherlands, eh? a, a, a board or an organization of, because she wanted to have one counterpart to speak with. And uh, so, uh, well, that's, I think that may be the solution, but it may also be part of the problem that Western governments, they want to supervise they want to deal with their Muslims 
and um, uh, from the other part, it's contradictory to the legal situation, to the legal constitution. So, and therefore, uh, there is no um, consistent policy towards Islam, even not in one European country, at least not in the Netherlands. And uh, I think that with your last remark, uh, you make it e yeah, worse than easier to cope with this problem. Um, on, uh, let me deal with the, the latter one first, government supervision and, and, and so on. Um, there's no doubt, especially after 9 11, that governments could not wish for anything better than to have a government approved uh, Islam uh, with its institutions, which controls, authorizes, etc., etc., um, the Muslim community. And uh, concomitant with that, of course, is that any Muslim or Muslim. Muslim movement that refuses that control is by definition radical and therefore falls under the um, purview of the security services. Um, the world's not like that. Um, I think for all kinds of reasons, quite apart from political rights, democracy, etc., etc., I think there are very good reasons for not uh, doing that. We are, uh, as, I as I suppose I've indicated between the lines, in my lecture, we are, we are, we're experiencing, especially in Western Europe with immigrated Islam, we're experiencing a situation, a phenomenon, which is a transitional phenomenon. Um, the, the whole process of Muslim communities, and they always have to be expressed in plural, of, of Muslim communities arriving, settling, integrating, whatever one means by that, is a process which doesn't uh, fit within our normal government institutional processes is not, a, is not a challenge to the system which can be solved by a five-year project and with, 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 with good central government investment. It's a process which will take at least three generations. Um, and the danger of developing a particular institutional structure at any given point in the middle of that transitional process the danger is that it locks the process into place in a particular situation, in a particular stage of the process, and therefore creates a contributes to creating a social institutional pathology. Um, Muslims individually and collectively, particularly collectively, are prevented from developing uh, forms of institutional and collective participation which um, which should come about naturally in the natural everyday give and take of open society. And there's a classic example and I don't think it's a coincidence that it comes from Germany. Um, back in the late 70s uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a moral panic schools. Um, the, what was being taught, how it was being taught, you had headlines like he the von Hodja uh, and, and, and this kind of thing. And the government of North Rhine Westphalia uh, decided uh, that they needed to do something about this. The view at the time was that um, because Muslim organizations had not and effectively could not get uh, official status as Körperschaft der Frieden Rechts, they could not have access to religious education in the, in, the ordinary day, in the ordinary state schools on a par with Catholic or Protestant uh, children. Um, so they decided to set up a small uh, project which would create, um, and they got around the law by calling it Kreligiuse Unterweisung instead of Kreligiuse Unterricht, um, to create a uh, syllabus in the teaching uh, core of Islam for Turkish children. And in good thorough German fashion, it was a project which uh, first of all took two years to develop the concepts uh, and structures, and then another five years or whatever it was, maybe exaggerating slightly here, to test the lessons in class. And when it was finally rolled out, 
this situation had changed out of all recognition from what it was when they had set it up uh, in the first place, and it was no longer, uh, and it was, as a concept, it was, uh, it was out of date. Um, that's just one small example, and I think the uh, attempt to set up national Muslim organizations that can give the, the government one, um, one partner to speak to collectively uh, is at a, at a higher scale um, something similar. Participating scholars, I don't mean that you all become Snukhuranya uh, or Muftis of Utrecht. Um, what I mean is, uh, well, what I meant uh, when I stuck at the end of the paper there was that as Western scholars of Islam, Muslim societies, we, whether we like it or not, we are contributing to um, to policy decisions, not just in Europe, but also in the Muslim world, uh, to people making choices, um, which once we produce that scholarship, we have no influence over. Um, whether we like it or not, we are participating. A good example might be um, the whole business about me. In the last 10, 15 years, Western scholarship on Islam, on Islamic movements and Islamic theology, law, etc., has mainly been interested in the revival of conservative, traditionist, quote unquote, fundamentalist Islam. Has been paying very little attention. Uh, to what you might generally put under the umbrella term unsatisfactory of liberal or moderate Islam. Um, by making those choices, we are undermining that we are actually deliberate. I mean, I hear this from Muslim scholars themselves. I'd be interested to see what Muslim has to say. Uh, we are undermining those voices among Muslim scholars in the Muslim world who are trying to develop alternative Islamic responses. Uh, I suspect Muhammad Salim Hawa is not one of your best friends. Um, but <laughs> uh, there is someone who uh, is quite important intellectual voice within the kind of mid-range of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, who has for several decades now tried to develop from within the Muslim tradition um, and that's important, from within the Muslim tradition has tried to develop concepts of Islamic democracy, human rights, citizenship, and so on and so forth. Not the kind of thing that, and here I make it some people angry, not the kind of thing that Falcon Mendesi has been doing, which is starting from a Western concept of feminism and then dressing in an Islamic dress. Um, Nobody is fooled by that. Um, when I met Muhammad, most recently, it was a conference in Tunisia about two months after the invasion of Iraq had started. And I asked how he was getting on. His daughter was on the staff of, is on the staff of Birmingham University, was there for a colleague. Um, and he said, I can no longer stand up in front of a, a, an audience in Egypt and talk about Islamic democracy. Uh, I am immediately uh, accused of being Bush's poodle. Um, by the very fact of... Sorry, is it Thomas Lee Lauer? Yeah. Um, by selecting to focus on certain aspects, certain trends within Islam, we are legitimizing them. We are delegitimizing the, 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 the other trends. Um, and that's why I argue for a recognition of the potential. The fact that Islam is generally so and so, so and so today, and this is where one gets into serious debate with people like Midlas and Ayan Hishyari. Um, the fact that Islam seems to be in, of such and such a character today. It doesn't mean that it necessarily is so always. 
doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be something else. And we have enough resources in the tradition to show that it can be something else. And we, I, mean, I certainly know enough people who have Muslim scholars who have been developing Islamic, Islamic ideas in other directions than the one that Islam is generally portrayed as representing. And by not acknowledging those, by simply dismissing, well, they're not representative, we're undermining them. And this is what I accuse, this is where I started the paper, the reference to, I mean, one or two of you may be able to guess who I'm referring, who, who I was referring to, the uh, Christian evangelical scholar of Islamic law who was a major influence um, uh, in the 50s and the 60s in the period of British decolonization. Any suggestions? Norman Anderson. Um, no, no, evangelical. He was a very, he was an evangelical Christian. He was used by the British government and actually by the Egyptian authorities as well to help legislate uh, reform of Islamic family law. Um, but he, would, he, 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 by dismissing new ideas from someone like Dr. Hamandoy. He was essentially delegitimizing him and contributing to delegitimizing him because there's a um, paradoxical conservative Muslim scholars who otherwise reject Western Orientalist scholarship will actually seize and you know, find support in those Western scholars who agree with them. I think you were uh, quite very, very uh, complicated uh, issues uh, that you brought. Uh, to discussion in this uh, overboard lecture. Uh, I would like to return back uh, in, in some sort of uh, uh, comment or elaboration on uh, how uh, traditional sources are being brought into light by modern scholars. Uh, you mentioned at least three names of my country. Uh, and Fahmi Kuyidi and even Tariq Ramadan from, from Egyptian background. And you referred in a very uh, important way how uh, they brought back into life uh, some sources that were not really present uh, in, uh, in historical tradition like the Medina uh, agreement between Muhammad and, uh, and the other community and the Shatibi uh, and others. Uh, I would like to, to make a comment on the way these traditional sources have been misfit for desirable reason, ideological reason to be to reach this point of modernization. Uh, that the, the Medina, for example, does not speak about one woman. Speak about every group for an ummah. The Muslims are ummah, the Jews are ummah, and the third part of so the pagan, the, non, the, the, the pagan Arabs are not another ummah. And every ummah is independent from other ummah in organizing their own internal affairs. So it's some sort of tribal agreement. So if I would say the new community of Muslims formed a tribe, so there were the three tribes of Jews and but this 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 very important text has been neglected immediately after two years. Because the Muslim community became triumph. And Muhammad became the ruler of, of Medina. That's why it does not show in Mawirdi or in uh, uh, in or in other sources. Because it has was pretty gun like like Mansur, like abrogated. No one thought about abrogation. But it was it was gone. In all the efforts with modern scholars to uh, to uh, to make a progress an Islamic explanation of uh, equal citizenship, to wave away this kind of Zimni uh, position, the minority, uh, the protected people under. In all the 
way they are doing very good, but not touching the real foundational organic passage that is, you have to go around it. Okay, so we are going around this, this text. I'm unable to say, well, the Quran is talking about non muslim should pay Jizya for tax, humiliate even. The expression, you know the expression. I cannot translate it into, into English. So we are going around to say it's, this was a historical practice. It does mean that the passage here is historical. Whether it is Mansu or not Mansu, but it's, it does not, it should not be taken as establishing a legal position. But no one dared to say this. Even to so we are, we are working around, around the foundational the foundation text. Uh, another, another problem, even with, uh, with this first, the, the, I think the judge, the, the German judge was right. <laughs> I'm not defending her position. Not the German I'm judge. defending her, her logic. Her logic. This verse about beating women, I'm sure you know how much efforts have been made since I mean I do it. In the, in, the, in the present context of feminism about this text. And they are going to the cherries in order to find a way what, to, to be what does it mean? And they found very funny solutions. They are funny. Because if you go to a dictionary, you have all the possibility of one lexical meaning of one verb disconnected with any lexical meaning. Relationship like what Daraba man, Daraba feel, Daraba Adam. So they found some solution and they found it very, in a very funny way. Okay, and with this, we see the camel, Daraba, she camel. It means having sexual relationship. So they said, well, okay, you know, Daraba in the Quran means, you know, proposing sexual relationship. It's funny. Funny what? I mean, what is, the, what is the problem here? What is the inductive, deductive, uh, I mean, this topic from the proposal about Shafi, deductive about Hanafi, inductive, and about you know, Shafi. Is, what was the Shafi being inductive or, or deductive? Okay, of course he discovered, okay, not really discovered because it was before him by the Zen. But, but it was but formalized in a very good way by by Shakti. I think I think I think now going back to traditional sources, okay, was a very very good movement in the 19th century and the first uh, first half of the 20th century. But since then, Muslim scholars have been going around all the time. I mean, it's. Uh, the vicious circuit. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no way out. There's no exit. That's why fundamentalism is always turning off. I mean, I mean, Salafism or fundamentalism. Or this, that's why I'm always I cannot really stand in a public lecture and defend democracy. The way out, I, I, I think it's, it's, it has to go beyond this. You know. Sharia-oriented Islam. What I mean by Sharia Islam, but Islam, that Islam has been limited, reduced to Sharia issues, legal issues, marriage, divorce, etc., 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 without going back to revisit the theological foundation of this of, of this of this interpretation. Uh, all all these efforts are returning back. Okay, it was successful since Muhammad Abdul Rahman Rashid did not. But then it is returning back. The position of non Muslims in Egypt now is a problem, a real problem, something that we can get back from the 19th century. And we have to address this question. Okay, this was my, my yeah, the, the misuse or the ideological reading of, of, of traditional sources without putting these sources in their historical context. That 
people better, who can get a better understand this source. My analysis to the objectives of what we shall to be, I might be wrong, but this is at least what I reach to, is coming from the Bipinan code. So it's coming from the domain of Sharia. Protection of religion is against apostasy. Uh, protection of the family is against fornication or blockade. So all the five protection is coming basically from Pinan code. The entire Quran outside the Quran code, the narrative structure, the only view of the Quran is not present in the Shakti analysis of the, 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 the Muslim. Because Shakti at, at the end was a uh, This is the dilemma in which, in which uh, even Muslim, Muslim modernists are in prison. That we we need a critical reading of tradition, not just to find a way through, uh, uh, through, through tradition. Uh, this, this is a real, a real dilemma, and I, I agree with you that Western scholar should be more engaged. Let me, let me speak about Quranic studies. Quran, Western, Western, Western Quranic studies scholar are, are, are focusing on history structure for this. They are not really involved in the question of meaning. While Muslim scholars are basically focusing on the question of meaning, now the question of meaning is not only for Muslim scholars, it's for the entire world. Because as you say, Islam is anywhere. And there is no there is no way out. I mean nothing nothing is going to change the, the, the reality in which Islam became part of whatever you call the West or Europe or uh, <coughs> so the meaning of Islam, the meaning of the foundation of the text of Islam should be the concept of Islam <coughs> and Islam should be engaged in uh, a creative, <coughs> a creative uh, uh, cooperation in, in, in this, uh, especially of Quranic, Quranic uh, study fields. And well, I would end with a question <coughs> from your comment I know that you have part, maybe the first one, to coin this European Islam. Well, it has been, it has been taken by other people, I think. <laughs> oh, no. Now your presentation, now your answer to the question seems that the concept is very, very problematic. Having this different uh, context in every European country. So what kind of Islam is, is, is expected? I mean, and, and European Islam, what does it mean? I mean well, maybe I'm a little bit you know, more, more critical uh, to, to this, this context. But how do you see uh, the possibility of Muslims living in Europe or living in the West to develop uh, a certain version understanding of, of Islam that it is not that it is not the same version that exists in in in, in I don't know uh, majority of Muslim Muslim countries. In other words, do you take the concept of fiqh, a minority fiqh, as something functional? Could be functional. Exercise, fit that every is fascinating. Yes. But only as an intellectual exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it goes back to this uh, this analysis, which uh, where, where I, for example, quote. I mean, in, in a sense, by engaging in fit, the entire Uber is contradicting his own analysis. Uh, if the Sharia is the religion, ethics, and law, what's the uh, and that in a secular minority situation, uh, the legal aspect of Sharia. Uh, should be, can be uh, put aside, then what's the point of engaging in fiqh the, 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 the law of the minorities, or minority law. Um, he, he might as well be honest, and it's interesting that Tariq Ramadan has moved in that direction. Tariq Ramadan has, um, I think he initially toyed with the idea of fiqh 15 years ago, but he's long since dropped it. Um, and and uh, he and others, and I think Fikr Kalajic is more honest 
on, on this as well as the people around him at these two different times in Sarajevo, that uh, is now in this kind of environment, um, speaks to its followers as religious practice and belief, and as an ethical <coughs> practice, as uh, I think it's terrible. Um, the people have said about Fiqh you know, why bother, why don't you just call it ethics, because that's what you're talking about. Um, if, if you're talking about minority law, I mean, unless you get into the very complicated areas of uh, legal pluralism, um, which is a legal anthropological field, um, normal, in, in normal everyday usage, law is something that's falls under the jurisdiction of courts. And uh, people who talk about fiqh and akhariyat, the minority law, don't normally, there are some exceptions, don't normally also talk of having a separate Islamic legal, uh, Islamic court system. Um, they are talking of it, in effect, as an ethical <coughs> system. So why not just call it that? Why, why confuse themselves and others by calling it fiqh? Um, the Eurotism was fascinating and very, <coughs> very important um, elements of discussion here because basically uh, I mean, I've worked with Muslim PhD students from Islamic faculties since the 1980s from Malaysia, Kuwait, Saudi, uh, Lebanon, stretching right across the theological spectrum from th radical modernizers through to um, and then I through some of my ex students from his um, through to good, solid Wahhabi Salafists from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and one thing that blocks them, which you're pointing in the direction of without expressing without expressing it explicitly is the fundamental theology of the Quran. Um, there comes a point at which it's almost there's an invisible barrier. Um, can't cross over that one. It's almost as if it's, in, in some cases it's quite explicit, but, but there's almost as if um, it's uh, it's instinctive in, in, in many cases. The problem with the theology of the Quran is that the, the Quran is a fundamentalist text. If you take the definition of Christian fundamentalism as it was developed in the early 19th century, early 20th century in North America, um, one very definite, one very core element of Christian fundamentalism was that the Bible was ipsissima now. Mm -hmm. It was the literal word of God. The idea that it was the gospel according to, very important in the King James' version of this, it's the gospel according to St. Matthew. It's the gospel according to St. Luke. These are very explicitly human writing, interpreting, or giving a version of the gospel. Christian fundamentalism in North America said no. These are literally, word for word, at least in the Hebrew and Greek versions, where sometimes one's not quite sure about North American evangelicals, but they don't think that English is the language of God. Um, <laughs> but if that is one definition of fundamentalism, then the scriptural, literal, Revelation. Then there's no. Then, then using the term fundamentalism applied to Islam makes no sense because if you don't believe that, then so far as the vast majority of Muslims can say, you're not Muslim. Uh, and it's very interesting in that connection that the one or one of the classical resources which might help to break that. Um, 
is what does it. Now I didn't go into that because we're into a very complex uh, dimension of the, history, the early history of Islamic theology and philosophy. But certainly in Sunni Islam, um, Moctezilism is the ultimate curse of someone's ideas. Um, Abdul, in his Nisel uh, Tawheed, his letter on the unity of his <laughs> letter on the unity of God, Abdul was the reforming. Uh, Rector of Al-Azhar died in 1905. Um, in, his, in the first edition of his Yusef Tawheed, he came very close to being explicitly Moctezid. He adopted, in fact, the definition of the Quran by the Quran. Exactly. The second edition, that was removed. That was removed. Um, it's, there's a kind of if you say that some of the ideas are Moctezumite, you are basically labeling the idea as one which the consensus of the Sunni community dismissed as illegitimate 1100 years ago. It is a non-starter, it's historical, it's a fossil, uh, and that's it. In fact, a lot of A lot of modern Islamic theological discussion actually uses the language of Moctezuma. This emphasis on Islamic on Islam being a rational religion. The moment you start talking about Islam being a rational religion, you're effectively echoing the ideas of this dismissed tendency. Um, and if you go into a a group of ordinary school educated but not theologically educated Muslims in Europe today and put the question to them Do you believe the crown is created or uncreated? They would think, what a silly question. Well, that's a stupid question. Of course the crown is created. God is the creator and there is nothing beside God. But in fact, when you say that, you are echo, you, you, you are actually repeating a more pessimistic idea that's been declared heresy by the majority of the Muslim community 11 years ago. And the moment, you, the moment you follow up on the idea that the Quran is created, and some Muslim scholars can temporary them, would you think yourself to be like that? No. I, I start with that. <laughs> I start um, you're more likely to find people with these ideas among the Shia. Interestingly. And you get so much more serious and explorative philosophical theological discussion among the Shia today than you do among the Sunnis. It's almost as if you're, if you're an Arab Sunni and you want to follow philosophical discourse, you have to become a secularist. You cannot do that and at the same time be a serious Muslim Islamic scholar. Uh, in Shia Islam, you can be a philosopher and be a, be a serious religious authority at the same time. Um, I was in a discussion once with precisely the Shiite uh, theologians, including some pretty conservative Ayatollahs. Uh, one of them was the one who, uh, who, who keeps reviving the reward for the murder of uh, uh, Salman Rushdie. Um, and he was faced with the question about 15 years ago, I'm um, meeting in Birmingham. He was faced with the question um, if there were, these Shiite scholars were banging on about reason, reason, reason. Um, and he was faced with the question, if there is a contradiction between your reason and the Quranic text, what do you do? The answer was, we follow reason. Because reason is the hermeneutical key. If you don't understand it, if, if the text contradicts reason, it is because you don't understand the text. You're only human. The text is uh, divinely, di di divinely revealed. Uh, and the only way you can understand an, un an, an incomprehensible or contradictory text is by using reason. If the text seems to be contradicted by reasons because you don't understand the text correctly. But the moment you move, you're moving in those kinds of theological lines, you open the door to all kinds of Quranic interpretation, which are impossible, which is impossible with the traditional 
uh, with the traditional um, Quranic view. I mean, it'd be very interesting to see what your Shiites come up with when as you begin to discuss with them what they think it means to be Muslim in practice uh, in, in, in Europe. Precisely because of this. Does it mean anything? Because um, there's an enormous amount of crossover uh, going on. That's one of the, one of the, one, one of the factors of, of, Islam, of, of Islam in modernity is that the walls between the various schools of thought, which were pretty firm in the pre-modern period, those walls are becoming permeable. Things are osmosing through those walls. I mean, just in the political field, um, the whole idea of martyrdom in political in, in, in violent political resistance in places like Palestine and so on, martyrdom was never a big issue in Sunni Islam. It's something that's been absorbed over from Shiite Islam. Um, and there's, a, there's an enormous amount of this going on. Um, and I think we have to, and I think, I don't think it's impossible. That's why, that's why I, I, I conclude on this, this piece of the, of the um, in analysis by potential. I think it's the, and then here I may be too much of a materialist. Uh, for some, for, for some people, I think it's the circumstances, the material circumstances, predominantly, which are a major factor in determining which ideas win the argument and which lose the argument. And those circumstances can change, so the arguments which were lost in the past can be won in the present. Um, in one of the tragedies of the geopolitical situation of the last. 10, 15 years, well, since the collapse of the Soviet system, is that the geopolitical system, the clash of civilizations, all of that discourse, not to mention Western policy towards certain parts of the Western world, have actually made it more difficult for reformist uh, ideas to take hold. They have strengthened the institutions. The, the, the geopolitical institute, the situation has strengthened the institutions which have a vested interest in no change. I mean, Azhar is infinitely stronger now than it was 25 years ago. The ulama of the uh, Islamic faculties are much more influential now than they were 25 years ago. And that's not just because they have been clever in one of the arguments. On the contrary. Right to the fly? Yeah, yeah. I'm not looking to the fly, but I, I, I do agree about this, the possibility of ideas in, in a changing world that have been suppressed to return back. Uh, but, they, but it needed also to return back this idea from a critic, by critical analysis, not just by, by taking the Martesina position or taking the Averroes position. So as, as, as I said, I, I started as, as a Martesian myself from the very beginning, very fond of, you know, very Martesian rationalism, but then I became aware of the deficit of the historical definition of, of rationalism and how it just tried to pull the meaning of the text into one direction and to push the other direction into, into the dark. And the other direction was taken as you uh, take by, you know, Nahman and then in Tamiya and the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. Okay, and we still in the same position. So the, 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 what, what, what we need besides it's, it's, it's optional, it is very, very present in the Shi debate. But unfortunately also, modernly, I have just got the news about one of the scholars of the Quran that have been physically attacked. In Iran, this is more than 65 years old because the situation now that the American pressure over, uh, uh, you know, over Iran and Ahmadinejad, they are against any kind of intellectual progressive thought. Okay. So now again, you, you refer that to that your last remark about the responsibility of the West or Europe or whatever uh, in blocking or at least not really encouraging okay, 
this kind of reformation that had been going on uh, from the 19th century. But it has to go, you know, ups and downs according to the relationship between the two. So something has to be done about it. I think it, I'd be interested to uh, hear what the social anthropologist has to say on this. Because one of, uh, I think, one of the explanatory processes which seem not to be focused on much is that all this is taking place or has taken place in the context, in the social context of a massive migration from the countryside into the cities. Cairo um, or Beirut of the 1940s and 50s uh, uh, are, are unrecognizable today. Um, the audience, the market in the, the audience, the, the consumer in the market of ideas um, in the big cities of the Middle East, or in Europe for that matter, in Muslim communities, is not, is not the same as it was two or three generations ago. Um, one talks about the ruralization of the big cities uh, rather than the urbanization of, um, of communities in the Middle East. I mean, a place like Beirut contains now more than well over 50% of the population of the whole country. Um, and we don't need to put statistics on the growth of Cairo and Damascus and Baghdad and Tehran and so on and so forth. Um, and the people who were the consumers, and therefore the political movements of the modernist ideas were the urban bourgeoisie, primarily. And so you've got this strange situation where there's a disconnect between two different parts of society. I mean, refer to another one, I didn't mention here, Hayat al uh, who published in, in, in 1927, published a Egyptian scholar, Azhar. 1927 published a book on Islam and the roots of uh, and the, and the foundations of government, uh, in which he argued that the, uh, the prophet uh, actually had two different roles. One was that of the religious role of the prophet, and that the other was that of the political leader. And he, I mean, I think he's actually speaking as a historian. I think he's uh, misusing the sources, but he has a purpose. And his purpose is to separate the, polit the political from the religious, uh, which we are otherwise always told Islam is politics and religion. He was immediately uh, told to shut up, and again, it's one of these sets of ideas that we are told by the Sunni scholars has been rejected. But his book is constantly being reprinted. You can find it in the shops. There are people reading it. Now, that's not the kids from the village. It's the urban bourgeoisie. It is that class, that group, which was the politically dominant group before the Second World War, but which has lost its political domination, um, among other things, because of migration from the countryside into the city. Um, I've seen that in Mauritius, and um, especially, uh, yeah, that's actually, it's an old story that, I mean, for example, Eiffel Man has, has demonstrated, um, as, um, as an anthropologist, has documented that long ago for the Arab world, that um, you, you're dealing with an increasingly informed Muslim public, which is, um, which, which is much more engaged in debates. That uh, also has to do with the spread of modern media. But it doesn't mean you get some sort of reformism in, in, a, in a modern sense. And it uh, just, you, know, you may have, it may be the outcome in Europe, but it may not necessarily be the outcome in, in South Asia. And I do have another question, but of course I asked one already, so I'm happy to. It seems that we're kind of swinging or hoping between law, politics, history, sociology, cultural anthropology, philosophy, and theology. And in a way that is sad, because it kind of never happens in any other lecture, because we all have our own discipline that we talk about. And perhaps it has to do with the undifferentiatedness of Islam being everything. Uh, but I want to focus on a legal aspect, being the legal theorist myself. And for, for many reasons, I think we, we often seem to equate Islam or the body of text that represents Islam as a body of law. Uh, for, uh, and we do that in particular 
because of how we try to understand the Islamic texts. Uh, because we have to interpret it, because it's already translatable, uh, for, for one reason. And the interpretation, of course, is always a, a difficulty. And that's what we lawyers do as well. Day in, day out, we are interpreting law. And we try, and we need to interpret it because we have to apply it on the concrete case. And the concrete case, there's a gap between the concrete case and the generality of the law. So we have to find the middle ground. So we do interpret it. And we have all kinds of modes of interpretation. Um, like, so we have an historical interpretation, or a grammatical interpretation, or a systematic inter interpretation, and so on. Um, and what I am a bit bothered about, and which is also a discussion in law, is what the status is of these modes of interpretation. For some, they are rules in themselves, and there is some kind of hierarchical order in the modes of interpretation, whereas for others, and I would include myself uh, in that group, is that these modes of interpretation uh, are instrumental to the goal of law, or the goal of the Islamic text. And one goal could be, for example, to have tolerable and effective law. And it can be enforced and it's more or less just. And for that reason, we use interpretation. So as a judge, I know what my decision is, but I have to convince others, so I employ the mode of interpretation that suits my purpose. And often I detect these things in discussions about this land of text as well. So my concrete question is, because I don't know much about or anything at all about this uh, discipline, to what, what is the status of these modes of interpretation? Are they actually distinguished, or is it? I think the answer to the question really is impacted by the kind of changes that have taken place in the last 150, 200 years. Uh, if you look at classical texts, um, they seem to be very little, they seem to have very little concern with the law as something to do with courts. Uh, they are theoretical texts, especially as you move into the High Middle Ages, uh, their theoretical texts um, and the discussions among the scholars are primarily theoretical. Um, the modes of interpretation are a major part of the jurisprudential discussion, uh, the relative um, advantages or disadvantages of relative legitimacy or illegitimacy of certain uh, modes of interpretation. Um, there's been very interesting research appearing in the last 30 years or so. Um, it hadn't started yet when I was doing Islamic law with Anderson and Coulson. Um, where people, are, where, where um, archives have been made accessible, court archives, um, administrative archives, especially not the Empire, but not only. And, there's, uh, and the other area has been fatwas, uh, judicial opinions, um, which are um, certainly among Islamic, Islamic legal scholars today is all the rage. It's really the, 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 if there is one major area of Islamic legal research, Sharia research today, it's fatwas. Um, Why I refer to the problems raised by developments of the last 150 years is because um, in the Muslim world, the uh, introduction of Western forms of government, either directly through imperialism uh, or indirectly, um, the development of the modern, uh, of the modern bureaucratic state, <coughs> has meant that the nature of Islamic law has changed in some ways quite ironically because the classical struggle um, of the first 300 years or so of Islamic history was, was precisely over uh, control of the law um, 
in the end, that struggle was won by the scholar. Uh, the state was deprived of the right to legislate. So the state had to find other ways of uh, controlling the legal institutions by, um, by bribery of various, various levels of sophistication, um, including uh, founding um, colleges and universities and, uh, and, and places where the legal scholars could be educated, founding institutions where the legal scholars could be employed. Uh, the Mumble period was a particularly uh, good example of the state buying, buying legitimacy by funding and establishing uh, religious institutions where the scholars could uh, get some um, employment through which the scholars exercised their corporate um, power. When you get to the level of individual courts, where the Qadi, the judge, um, actually implements the law, um, you're much more into the field of anthropology than you are into the in the field of, of legal study in any traditional European sense. Um, the traditional Qadi uh, was primarily accountable to practice, was primarily account accountable to the community that he judged over. Uh, there were attempts in the early period she attempted to establish a centralized court system, uh, but the attempt failed for all kinds of practical reasons. Um, it's difficult to impose power when it takes two months for instruction, for information to arrive and instructions to go back. Uh, a lot of local autonomy is necessary to hold things for, for things to hold to hold together. Uh, and we know from research on biographical dictionaries and others through the um, 10th through 13th century that whenever the central powers attempted to appoint, impose a judge from outside, he didn't last very long. The judge that lasted long was the one who was appointed from inside the community. If I may interrupt, when you talk about the Cali system, isn't, isn't it a feature of the Cali system that they actually, the Cali's actually decide not on the basis of rules, which we in Western courts do, but rather on something else than rules, on pedigree. They accept, they, they, they accept facts, and they, they judge the validity of the facts. And the traditional party was concerned with justice in a traditional sense of justice. The traditional sense of justice was stability and equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, if faced with a, faced with a case, the party in the small town or the village would, yes, he would have his textbooks, and he would refer to them. But his primary concern was to ensure that the case was solved in such a way that the local uh, stability and equilibrium was not upset. Um, the, kind of the, the, the idea that there was some kind of uh, principle in the platonic sense out there which had to be applied, um, which we are kind of used to in our political discussions uh, today, was strange. And of course, there was no system of, there was no conception of precedent. So decisions that were taken uh, in these various courts didn't impact back on the textbooks. Uh, what happens with modernization is that you get a hierarchical court system with levels of appeal which in principle didn't exist previously, with levels of appeal, where judges are appointed uh, ultimately by the central government, and because of the appeal system, they're accountable ultimately to the Supreme Court, the stroke central government, uh, central government which is increasingly uh, passing legislation, which has to be followed. And so the local judge loses his accountability to the community and becomes accountable to something outside and in many ways, therefore, becomes estranged from the local community. Um, in fact, if you start looking at you know, ordinary everyday cases, I've experienced this myself, um, the local judge will still fiddle the books. But he does it by fiddling the books. So the books show that he has judged according to the expectations of the system. 
that in practice he's actually done something different, that the paperwork meets the expectations uh, of, of, of the system. Um, uh, my name is Clara Mus, and I'm, I'm uh, one, one of the people who's concerned with what's going on and trying to make sense of it. I was touched by the way you tried to find the light in this very complex and difficult issue. Um, and you made me very curious uh, to see if, if there's not only a relationship of influence between the minorities and the majorities in Western Europe, but between what we still call the minority in Western Europe and their majority in, for want of a better word, I would call it Islamia. Um, and as you said, there's, always, there's all these dimensions, the philosophical, the ethical, the religious one. Could you in, in, pick a few dimensions of your own choice and please say something about the influence that's going on from Islam in Western Europe to Islam in the Orient? That's a fascinating one. Um, it's a question that I've been faced with before. I was faced with it quite early in the 80s when I first started working on Islam in Europe. And my sense then uh, was that the power balances between the central, the central areas of the Muslim world and the minority outriggers in, 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 among the emigrating communities in Europe and North America, the power balance was such that the idea that anything might move back from the periphery into the center uh, was really impossible. I'm not so convinced any longer. Um, and I think if one looks to the future, depending on the circumstances, um, I think one can see a possibility of a possibly quite significant communication back. Um, I was in Jordan for a couple of months uh, on a study leave in the summer of 95 and ended up attending a weekly seminar at the uh, Muslim Brotherhood's think tank uh, in, in, in Jordan where they had invited speakers and in the end they asked me to give a lecture on Islam in Europe and I talked about how young people were adapting the kind of things that I hinted at here. And I was faced with a comment from one of the audience who I noticed in previous sessions was pretty hardline uh, Ikhwani, I suspect, from the way he acted and talked, but he was probably actually his battalion. But his comment or question was whether I thought that the main Muslim world might not learn from the Muslim minority experience because the main Muslim world, the central, central parts of the Muslim world, are having to deal with an encounter with modernity, uh, which the Muslim minorities in Europe uh, are encountering on a much broader and a much deeper, deep, deeper scale, whether some of that experience might feed back uh, so that the Muslim world centrally could benefit from it. Um, I can only shrug my shoulders and say possibly. Um, interestingly, Tariq Ramadan, in not his most recent book, Radical, but Radical, um, uh, Radical uh, Islam, but the previous one on Western Muslims, argues uh, that um, this is where the future lies. Certainly, the vast majority of modernist, reformist Islamic thinking is taking place outside the central Muslim lands. Not because the Muslims in the central Muslim lands can't do it, can't, they haven't, haven't, haven't got the intellect for it, it's because they're not allowed to do it. I and mean, as soon as um, Nasser is an example, but he's not the first and he's not the last. Uh, probably one of the most interesting um, modernist Muslim thinkers of the post, post Second World War period is Fazl al-Rahman. He ended up in Chicago. He was leading the uh, he was the boss of the um, Islamic Research Institute in Pakistan for many many years. But his ideas were, were, were acceptable, and he had to go into exile. 
found the uh, that was Professor Islamic Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, time after time, you're finding that um, radically new theological thinking, legal thinking, political thinking, social thinking is taking place uh, among um, Muslims in uh, European and North American, especially in North American universities. Now, they are widely read in the Muslim world by those who can read English and don't think because you've got dictatorships and censorship that people don't get the stuff. Um, even before the internet, um, I mean, with the internet, of course, it's unstoppable, but even before the internet, um, uh, you get stuff. Uh, in 1989, I was in, 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 in 89, I was in Jeddah, someone told me there that the, that the governor of Jeddah, who was a senior prince in the royal family, uh, Saudi, uh, was the chair of a local literary society, um, which is kind of the local haute bourgeoisie, I guess that term again. Um, intellectuals and so on meet once a month to discuss a topic or discuss a new book and so on. There was a new book that just been published in Egypt. Um, I think it was under the title of Islam before it was structured. Um, and this book had obviously been immediately banned in Saudi Arabia, but this literary society headed by a Saudi prince did, had, had, had a, one of its monthly meetings discussing this book. So I asked him, how did they get hold of it? Oh, it was faxed in. <laughs> faxed. 250 pages. And this book was distributed by fax to the members of this society. Um, and lots of stuff gets smuggled in through suitcases. It's quite easy to do it yourself. Um, so stuff gets made and it gets discussed. Uh, but, and that's where I get back to my reference to context. Given the current political, economic, whatever, 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 context, the power structures are such that these ideas can't take hold beyond the small groups of people who uh, are attracted, who read them, uh, who can afford to, to read them, who have time to read them, for whom it makes sense. Um, and that's why I think it's the analysis by potential is important because the current context is not internal. One can imagine a shift in balances of power, um, economic, political, cultural, and social, etc., etc., where suddenly um, there is an audience for such literature. And so certainly among young, young intellectuals, even within some of the Sharia faculties, interestingly. The stuff that's going on among Muslim scholars in European and North American universities is being made and is being read with interest. That is actually the last part of your talk when you uh, spoke of uh, immigrant communities in Western Europe and in particular Britain. Uh, of course, there are many reasons why these people feel discriminated and turned against the society and all that. But could it be? But one of the factors is that they're not so much against the Christians and the Christian religion, but there's so many happy non-Christians who live in these parts, and that can only spell disaster for them. <coughs> Look, uh, I don't think Christianity or, uh, the, 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 the Christianity is the problem. Um, no, that's what I'm yeah, I, mean, I think, I think uh, in a sense you're right. Um, I mean, the early days, I remember someone from the Islamic Foundation in Leicester suggesting that this is a, uh, an institution that, comes, that is associated with a movement that comes out of um, one of the conservative Islamic movements in Pakistan, the Jamaat Islami. Um, and he was arguing that uh, our problem is with secular, secular society and secular government. We should have dhimma status. We'd much prefer a dhimma status within I mean, the protected, circumscribed religious minority status that, uh, uh, that, that uh, traditionally has been allocated to Christians and Jews in the, in, in the Muslim world. Um, I don't think he got much support among his fellows, but it's an interesting way the discourse was, was running. Um, 
Um, the concept of secularism is highly problematical for a lot of uh, for a lot of, for a lot of Muslims, but certainly not for all. I mean, at the moment, I'm in the process of uh, with lead, I'm leading a team collecting um, the data for the first volume of uh, Yearbook of Muslims in Europe to be published uh, after the summer by Bro. So you can't afford it. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's in the data section, you know, how many Muslims are there in a given country? Um, what's fascinating there is that it's quite clear that in a lot of countries, including the Netherlands, that at least half of those who are tradition, who are conventionally termed Muslim, because if you're Moroccan ethnic origin, you're Muslim. If you're Turkish ethnic origin, you're Muslim. Um, if your name is Muhammad, you're Muslim, uh, whether you like it or not. The research indicates that at least half of those people have no practical relationship whatsoever with Islam. Um, its institutions, its practices, its beliefs. Uh, they might avoid pork. But that's the way you've been brought up, it's cultural. It's like you have to eat pork to be German. Um, <laughs> it's at that level of, uh, 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 as an identity marker. Now, the vast majority of those have no problem at all with the, with the society they're living in. Those, are the, they're those who have some form of practical relationship with them, I suspect the vast majority of those have no problems with the secular society that they, that, that they live in. I mean, certainly, uh, the kind of opinion polls that one's seen around uh, in, in various countries in Europe suggest that the vast majority of Muslims are happy with a multicultural, democratic, human rights <coughs> environment. Um, and then the cynical side of me says, ask, you know, so, so what, is, what, what is actually going on um, with the assertive Muslim leaderships and organizations? And I, I, I begin to suspect that uh, we're talking more politics than we're talking religion. Um, but of course, the noise determines agendas, both within the community and in the majority and in relationships between the majority. So I mean, it was actually there was actually there was an interesting uh, summary in the Economist uh, about just under two years ago of a series of public opinion polls that are taking place within Europe, within Britain, at a time when Britain was having one of its moral panics about what it means to be British, and they were talking about introducing citizenship tests and these kinds of things that Denmark and Netherlands uh, already had, um, and one of the opinion poll, one of the questions in one of these polls was, you know, what does it mean to be British? Um, it was an open-ended question, it was put to, not just to Muslims, but to a large variety of all kinds of different people. And, uh, among the uh, white respondents, you've got a, a high proportion of, what does it mean to be British? Well, to support the British football team, the English football team, to support the British rugby team, eat fish and chips, um, <laughs> and these kinds of things. Um, the highest percentage answering uh, freedom of speech, uh, human rights, and so on, were the ethnic minorities, including the Pakistanis and the Bangladesh. Much higher than the white English. Uh, so if one takes that definition, the immigrant ethnic minority groups were more English than the English. Your last remark, uh, saying that there are many people who are not have no practical relationship to Islam, but, and of course, but of course, in public discourse, the majority society often interpolated as Muslims, and that brings us back to the issue that uh, you, you brought up Talal Assad in the chapter you wrote in this book. And um, um, my follow-up question on this is again related to the debate uh, between the deep diversity in European Islam, but what makes European Islam European in the sense beyond, let's say, people who are Muslims who live on the European continent. Um, the, um, and um, yeah, I think you're, you're very right in stressing that the regimes of secularism, the histories of migration, the binational assist, migration systems are totally different and I'm really in sympathy with that so one can't um, emphasize this enough. But on the other side, um, are there not, are there 
political forces or cultural trends on a more pan-European level that matter as well. Um, despite all the diversity, internal diversity in the different origins of migrants and different tra trajectories they take, because we do have a European Union which coordinates policy, mostly not in a very smooth fashion. But um, and this really brings me to um, it reminds me of an argument that um, that Matti Bunzel, an anthropologist, an Austrian anthropologist who um, teaches in the United States, has recently brought forward. He himself has actually mostly worked on, on Jews in Vienna, in Vienna, among other things. And he's actually compared anti-Semitism with Islamophobia in contemporary Europe by, by saying, well, yeah, there are some common areas. Um, it's, about, it's a discourse about a religious minority, which is an inassimilable eternal enemy. But on the other hand, there are major differences. And the differences, he said, are such that anti-Semitism is a discourse that exists within the framework of the nation. It's about race and blood and purity and, and the threat of purity to the nation, while Islamophobia is a more recent discourse that is cultural and civilizational in a centralized manner, and it's about creating an ideological European unity um, and um, identity. It's about casting Europeans who until recently have been engaged in maximal intra-European violence as liberal, as uh, forward-looking, as secular, rational, and um, by contrasting it with the, with the Muslim other. So it's about, and for example, um, last year when there were the demonstrations against the planned big mosque in the city center of Cologne, you would find that right-wing radicals from Germany uh, were trying to mobilize, but they were actually coordinate, coordinating with people from Flams Belang who came over the border. And in an earlier period, right-wing radicals of European countries would have hated each other, um, the European other, but now they're coordinating against uh, um, a Muslim other, which, and this is actually what could cynically say one of the di political dimensions of Europeanization. And, and um, but the question is whether this applies uniformly across the Western Europe, or so this is something you would find in some country more than in others, and how does it interact with the largest picture you give um, rightfully, I think, about deep internal differentiation in the Western European form? Where's the European dimension then? I think the ways of the way to look at it, of course there's European dimension, but I think the, there, you, you can probably identify certain, certain themes which are common across Europe, but they have a different place in the relative hierarchy among them in different countries. Now, interestingly, the, 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 immediately you, you, you present this Austrian um, uh, analysis of uh, evaluation of anti-Semitism. That's one that's from Britain. I mean, but Britain, you don't talk about national purity. Um, but it was not, it's the idea is that this is, a, this is something that is, has been delegitimized now in Europe. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's something that uh, exists, but it's, it's totally banned from respectable public discourse. But, but of course, Islam, Islamophobia is something that's much more mainstream. It's the idea that there's a successor to anti-Semitism that is not like anti-Semitism, yeah. but works on a pan-European level rather than on the national level. Which yeah, what, what, what I'm saying is that that's even, the argument. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what I'm saying is that even even those um, trans-European phenomena uh, play out differently in in different countries, uh, partly because of the different heritages, to different contexts of the countries themselves. Um, I mean, uh, and, 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 and partly because of the different characteristics of the various component parts of the, um, uh, of the Muslim community. Um, what you've got in common is, of course, the fact that Muslims, that Muslims those who are consciously Muslim and thinking about it, are having to deal with living in a minority situation. Um, I think it's difficult to talk about living in a secular environment uh, because in some European countries the, the environment is a good deal less secular than it is in others and it depends on what you mean by secular anyway. Do you mean mm, yeah. official religion? Do you mean a split between them? Do you mean a secular culture? Uh, or regardless of religion, uh, state relationships? Uh, and if you, expand the, the, if you expand your purview to include North America, uh, you've got uh, again very different situations, very highly religious cultural environment in, in, in the United States, a highly religious, religious environment uh, in a in a secular state. Um, 
I think, you know, I think you, you, I mean, it's actually a very, uh, I suspect it's a very good analytical tool to uh, identify some of these common elements and then place them in relation to each other because in some countries some of them will be will, will, will play a more important role than others whereas in other countries it will be reverse um, you can start doing some, some, you, you can start doing a, a localization of, uh, of common uh, common traits in, in, in that way um, I mean, you've, got, you've got countries, especially now in Eastern Europe coming in. Uh, you've got countries there where Muslims have always been a minority. Uh, others where few, some where they've been a majority, but mostly countries where they've been a minority, but where there has been since Tsarist times have been officially recognized Muslim institutions which still exist. Uh, but where the, where, where the situation is really being destabilized by uh, immigration more recent from Muslim countries, in particular students, and therefore uh, people who are like, more likely to be Islamically assertive uh, in relation to, for example, traditional Tatar communities in Latvia. The time has almost uh, up. It's been a very rich and very generous session. I think mean, we only have enough um, references, except the Arabic ones I couldn't catch, to last us for some time. Thank you all. Of course. And uh, see you on the April 16th, the next session. <coughs> Please join me in thanking our distinguished guests. Wonderful.